Uh, good afternoon. The Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service in the District of Columbia will now come to order. I apologize for the delay, the slight delay in, in starting. We had uh, votes on the floor, but uh, let me uh, welcome all of the members. Uh, I'm told that Mr. Chaffetz, the ranking member, will be along shortly. He as well was on the floor. But uh, to all of our members, subcommittee uh, hearing witnesses and all those in attendance, the purpose of the hearing today is to examine the criteria used to determine the placement of D.C. code offenders, as well as to discuss the rehabilitation and reintegration challenges that these individuals face as a result of being imprisoned so far from their homes and supportive networks. The chair, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to this subcommittee D.C.-related oversight hearing entitled, quote, Housing D.C. Code Felons Far Away from Home, the Effects on Crime, Recidivism, and Reentry, end quote. Today's hearing gives the subcommittee the opportunity to examine the criteria used to determine the placement of D.C. Code offenders. In addition, we will examine the unique rehabilitation and reintegration challenges faced by these individuals as a result of being imprisoned such a far distance from their homes and support networks. As you may know, the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997, also known as the Revitalization Act, transferred the responsibility and costs associated with certain state criminal justice functions, including housing, parole, and supervised release of adult felons convicted under the D.C. Code, D.C. Criminal Code, from the District of Columbia to various federal governments, agencies. While considerable progress has been made over the past 10 years since the enactment of the Revitalization Act, a host of challenges regarding the implementation of effectiveness uh, on felon, felon supervision, reentry, and revocation systems and practices remain. Notably, D.C. Code felons are unique in that they are routinely housed hundreds of miles away from their homes. In addition to placement in the District of Columbia, nearly 5,700 D.C. Code felons are housed in 33 states in facilities owned or leased by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. While the majority of these individuals reside in facilities located in Pennsylvania and North Carolina and West Virginia, some D.C. Code felons receive placement in states as far away as Florida, Texas, and California. In recognition of the challenges <clears throat> posed by distant placement, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, pursuant to a 1998 Memorandum of Understanding executed with the District of Columbia, seeks to house each inmate within 500 miles of their home. However, a variety of factors, including the availability of beds, security concerns, and individual prison, prisoner medical needs may affect that placement. Accordingly, today's hearing is intended to both examine the Federal Bureau of Prisons prison's offender placement process and procedures, as well as explore how the issues of distance impacts the reentry process. With research suggesting that prisoners who have regular contact with members of their family have lower recidivism rates than those who do not, placement far away from the home makes the reentry process especially hard for D.C. ex-offenders. Ex-offenders also face many barriers that impede their return to society including a lack of education and minimal employment qualifications. I'd like to especially thank my colleague and friend, Congresswoman Ellen Holmes Norton, for her tireless work in this policy area and her work on uh, uh, keeping me up to date and, and uh, pushing on this issue. The subcommittee looks forward to continuing to work with her and her office as we conduct oversight on this issue, as well as other members of the committee. Again, I thank all of those in attendance this afternoon and I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses. I now yield uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here and uh, for your insight that we'll be hearing from today. Uh, at the onset, let me just say that this is one of the critical roles and functions of our government. You know, for most campaigns, people will tell you you're not going to win or lose an election uh, based on what happens with the Bureau of Prisons and these types of issues, unless something has really, really gone awry. But for me personally, I think it is one of those core functions that government is, should, should do and execute well and is a, a duty and a service to the, to the public. We also have to recognize that most people will be returning to the public 
And often, for instance, in my state, we refer to it as the Department of Corrections. But I often wonder, are we doing enough to actually correct uh, this behavior so that can people can turn to pr return to public, um, uh, to public life, and re you know, go back into society and be productive members of that society? Um, and so this is a, a, a long-term interest for me personally, and, and I appreciate holding this hearing. I was not elected to Congress yet when the Lorton facility was shut down in, in 2001. However, from what I understand, a number of congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle worked together in both the Clinton and the Bush administrations to facilitate the transfer of the D.C. prisoners to a newly built facility in North Carolina. And it's my understanding this change was much needed and a high priority for the local congressional delegation because of the extremely subpar conditions at the Lorton facility. In transferring inmates, the District of Columbia got a safe new facility at no cost to the city. Since the federal government absorbed the cost, the subcommittee, subcommittee was heard, has heard about conditions and programs in the facility and others where D.C. Fel felons are housed. On October 16, 2007, our predecessors on the subcommittee held a hearing entitled Doing Time, which focused on D.C. prisoners being prepared for reentry with access to the Bureau of Prisons Services. On September 22, 2009, we held a hearing on the local role of the U.S. Parole Co Commission which focused on alternatives to incarceration within the District of Columbia. And on February 3rd of this year, we held a hearing on halfway houses in the District of Columbia with testimony from many of the same entities we will hear from today. This additional view today is welcome, and we do appreciate your time. I remain interested in how the Bureau of Prisons and the Court Services and Offender Supervision, Supervision Agency work together to reduce recidivism. We all want ex-offenders to return safely to their communities, and this transition is difficult. Proximity of jail defenders to their communities is also a key factor for them and for inmates and their, and their families. But it is clear that released offenders can best succeed if they are sober, employed, and have a place to live. Otherwise, they are highly likely to go through the revolving door of the criminal justice system. Again, I think there is a proper role of government to help, that, to help those that are in need of making those transition back into their communities how we best do that in a cost-effective manner, but at the same time, wanting people to become self-sufficient, get back on their feet, I think is, is critical. That's, uh, that's why I appreciate uh, bringing up this, uh, this hearing today. I appreciate your insight and look forward to, to hear, learning more about the issue. With that, I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and may I again thank you for always being willing to, to hold hearings on matters of importance to the District of Columbia. And I'd like to simply summarize my opening statement uh, and to say that uh, of all the matters you could, in fact, hold a hearing on, nothing is more important than guaranteeing public safety in the District of Columbia, as well as facilitating the reentry of our men and women who are now spread across the United States uh, in prisons, many of them are far from home as a result of the Revitalization Act, um, affording uh, very little contact with their families or with services and making reentry a huge challenge to the city and to the inmates themselves and to the federal agencies, including the BOP, uh, who must work with them. Mr. Chairman, we do not ask in this hearing for changes in the Revitalization Act. We recognize that the District of Columbia asked for uh, this change. Uh, it wanted Lorton closed. Lorton was anything but a model prison. Uh, it wanted it taken off of its budget, and there are many advantages to the Bureau of Prisons, in my judgment, the Bureau of Prisons is the best prison system in the world. Now, that may not say much when you consider what <laughs> prisons look like in most of the world, but if you have visited the Bureau of Prisons, I think you would, would, would agree that it is a, a, a fine prison. The real question is, um, does it meet the challenges that Congress posed when, for the first time in U.S. history, Congress placed a state prison system within the federal prison system. Now, you can, you can put them there and spread them out as if they were all federal prisoners. They are not. There are 5,700 of these D.C. Code of Offenders, and I think it blows the mind 
Mr. Chairman, to recognize that they are in 115 different facilities in 33 states throughout our country. There are no state prisoners who face this kind of dispersal, lack of access to families and to services for all that means for them, for the city, and for the city to which they, they must return. In fact, best practices make clear what happens, frankly, in every state, that from the time a, an inmate uh, is in the criminal justice system uh, to the time he is released and post-released, the authorities have a r relationship with him to, that must assure his successful re-entry. So that if we were in Maryland or Virginia, a state system, for example, uh, that uh, these services, these, um, this par these parts of the criminal justice system would all be working together uh, with the uh, uh, offender. Um, now, the challenge created here is that we're dealing with, in our federal system, uh, federal agencies like the Bureau of Prisons and SESOSA on the one hand and facilities here in the district, not to mention the Parole Commission on the, the other. So you have a meeting of state and, uh, and local uh, agencies that will call for greater um, understanding and coordination and frankly creativity to in fact deal with this unprecedented challenge in our city. For example, the Bureau of Prison doesn't have to um, um, be nearly in touch uh, with the um, local needs of a city the way should should occur when they have this, this uh, set of state prisoners in their midst. Um, Prison parole and supervision agencies in each state uh, serve only offenders in that state. That's not the case here. It doesn't mean it's impossible to deal with. One of the challenges we'll be hearing from, if you're in a state prison system, you're closer in touch, for example, with uh, the, the resources and skills necessary to get a job. Um, that's going to be pretty hard if you're in North Dakota or Arizona. Or, or Wyoming or wherever BOP uh, has sent you, you're learning a skill, I'm pleased to say. I have gone to BOP facilities impressed with uh, what they do in vocational training. It doesn't have much relationship to what these men and women will find when they get back home. Um, uh, almost none of these facilities can be called close to home. Sosa tries to do what it can. It can reach only a fraction of those who will be returning home. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will be uh, absolutely candid. Uh, I think the answer is placing DC code felons in one BOP facility closer to DC. Men, women, and yes, we have children all the way in North Dakota. They should be brought home right now. Uh, and, and, and made closer to home. In the meantime, we can do a better job of coordinating reentry and the needs of these DC code felons for some contact with their family before all of a sudden out of prison uh, into the district they are expected to somehow act as they would if they had been in an ordinary state prison where they would have had access to their families, to some sense of services, uh, and to the true integration in, into reentry. So, Mr. Chairman, this is a very important hearing for the District of Columbia. I couldn't thank you and the ranking member more uh, for assuring this hearing today. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, before I read the introductions of our, our panelists. Uh, it is the custom of this committee to ask anyone who is going to offer testimony before the subcommittee to be sworn. Uh, so could I ask you all to rise and raise your right hand? Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Let the record show that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Let me begin. Mr. Lappin. Mr. Harley Lappin has served as the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons since April 4, 2003, a career public administrator in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Mr. Lappin is responsible for the oversight and management of the Bureau's 115 institutions and for the safety and security of more than 210,000 inmates under the agency's jurisdiction. Deputy Director Adrian Poteet serves as the agency head of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, CSOSA, for the District of Columbia. In, the position, in this position, Ms. Poteet oversees a federal agency of nearly 1,300 employees, which was created by the D.C. Revitalization Act of 1997 to improve public safety through active community monitoring and supervision of ex-offenders. Ms. Nancy Levine is the current director of the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Ms. Levine is an expert on crime prevention and prisoner reentry and is the founding director of the U.S. Department of Justice's Mapping and Analysis, excuse me, Mapping and Analysis for Public Safety Program. Mr. Philip Fornese, is that correct? Mr. Philip Fornese joined the D.C. Prisoners Legal Services Project as executive director in, <clears throat> in August of 2003. In addition to his primary management and fundraising responsibilities, Mr. Fornese also manages the D.C. Prisoners Legal Services Project's public policy work, which is aimed at advocating for the humane treatment and dignity of all persons convicted, charged, or formally convicted with a criminal offense under the District of Columbia law. Mr. Lewis Sawyer, we have him mixed up here, but uh, let me. Mr. Andrew Cook is a former D.C. code offender and Bureau of Prisons inmate. Having only been recently released from prison, Mr. Cook is continuing his effort to reintegrate back into society by participating in various transitional programs and by searching for employment opportunities. Mr. Lewis Sawyer is a current parolee under the supervision of court services and, and offender supervision agency. Mr. Sawyer was released from prison earlier this winter and is presently participating in a job training program with the organization so others might eat. Uh, as you, I know some of you have testified here before, uh, so I want to thank you all uh, for offering your, your advice and counsel to the committee. Uh, I would now like to give each witness a, an opportunity for a five-minute opening statement. Mr. Lappin, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. Congresswoman Norton, thank you for your kind comments during your opening statement. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Bureau of Prisons designation process, particularly as it affects the reentry needs of offenders from the District of Columbia. The Bureau of Prisons is the nation's largest correction system. We are responsible for the incarceration of more than 211,000 inmates, including 5,408 inmates convicted in the District of Columbia Superior Court. We refer to this population as DC Code offenders. We appreciate the unique role the BOP plays in the District of Columbia. While the number of D.C. Code offenders is relatively small compared to the entire inmate population, we devote substantial resources to ensure they receive appropriate care and treatment. Given our decades of experience, we know that consistency is critical to effectively achieving our mission. For this reason, we employ a validated objective classification system to designate all inmates. Our policy is to initially designate each inmate to the lowest security level facility possible given medical, security, and program needs and an institution within 500 miles of the anticipated release area. This is consistent with the requirements of the Memorandum of Understanding between the District and the Office of Management Budget that was signed in 1997 as a precursor to the National Capital Area Revitalization Act. Crowding in federal prisons across the country has had a profound impact on our inmate designation process. We have experienced significant increases in the inmate population over the last two decades. The Bureau of Prisons is operating at 37 percent overrated capacity system-wide, with high security institutions operating at 51 percent over capacity and medium security institutions operating at 46 percent overrated capacity. 
Stated quite simply, this level of crowding means there are not always available beds for offenders as close to their homes as we would like. Crowding poses real risk to inmate safety. Additionally, prison composition can greatly impact safety and security. Inmates in the federal prisons across the country have repeatedly demonstrated the proclivity to organize based on geographical area, gang affiliation, racial and ethnic backgrounds. And they have further demonstrated that such organization can lead to misconduct and attempts to severely disrupt prison operations. Accordingly, we make every effort to distribute the inmate population across facilities such that we balance the various factors noted above. We have found that this balance is critical to operating safe and secure prisons. Inmate health care needs impact designations, particularly for inmates with medical conditions that require significant treatment. These inmates typically are designated to a medical care level three facility or a federal medical center. Only six of these are within 500 miles of the District of Columbia. Location itself cre creates designation pressures. We have little control over where prisons are built and many are sited in very remote locations. We have made clear in the past our strong desire to site a prison in the DC area. As Congresswoman Norton will recall, we fought hard to secure just a small portion of the Lorton property during the negotiations over the Revitalization Act. We were unsuccessful in those efforts and had to look elsewhere to construct facilities to absorb the DC sentenced felons into our system. We remain committed to the goal of housing majority of DC code offenders within 500 miles of the district. And we have been quite successful in meeting this goal with over 75% of them currently confined in institutions within 500 miles of the districts. Four categories of offenders, however, are likely to continue to be housed outside that radius. Inmates with special management and security needs. Inmates with significant medical needs. Inmates who engage in significant misconduct and high security sex offenders. Mindful of our role as the State Department of Corrections for the district, we provide specialized programming and opportunities for DC offenders that will help facilitate their successful reentry while ensuring that they are housed in safe and appropriately secure facilities. We provide enhanced uh, reentry programs at Rivers to include a resident, residential drug abuse program that allows el eligible inmates to earn up to one year off their sentence. We have a trauma treatment program for female offenders at Hazleton, West Virginia. We have a residential reentry centers that service three DC facilities uh, to include Hope Village, which is the largest RRC in the nation. And finally, we continue to collaborate with court services and offender supervision agencies to on transitional issues. Chairman Lynch, this concludes my formal statement. Again, I thank you and the members of the committee for your support of our agency and be happy to answer questions that you may have of me. Thank you, Mr. Lappin. Ms. Poteet, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Schaeferts, Congresswoman Norton, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to appear before you today at this hearing to examine the impact of housing DC inmates far from home. As the Deputy Director of the Federal Agency responsible for supervising approximately 16,000 men and women, I know firsthand that the foundation for an individual's successful reentry starts with time spent in prison. If credible opportunities for treatment, education, and occupational training are available and taken advantage of, and in comprehensive release planning occurs, a person can leave prison with a real chance to pursue a positive and constructive way of life. Approximately 6,000 DC Superior Court sentence inmates are now serving their sentence in Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities around the country. Since our agency was established in August of 2000, Two in incarcerated men and women have returned to the District of Columbia at a rate about 2,200 per year. CISOS's transitional <coughs> intervention for parole, supervision, TIPS teams are primarily responsible for facilitating an inmate's return home from prison, either transitioning through a residential reentry center or directly to the community. BOP case managers submit a release plan to CISOSA that includes the inmates' proposed living arrangement and, when available, their potential employment. The TIPS community supervision officers investigate their release plans to ensure they are conducive to a successful reentry and do not pose a risk to the community. About 6,400 of the 16,000 men and women under supervision are either on parole or supervised release. Most have long histories of substance abuse, educational underachievement, and underemployment. 
80 to 90 percent of this population reports a history of illicit drug abuse. They have low rates of high school or GED completion, and only 40 percent report stable housing arrangements upon intake. Less than 40 percent are employed. Many of them also face challenges reuniting with their families and establishing pro-social relationship. These conditions can have a significant impact on the success of community supervision. However, it is well recognized that when effective work on these matters can be accomplished during incarceration, the perspective for successful reentry is increased. It was toward that end that in 2003, CISOSA launched an initiative at the Rivers Correctional Facility in Winton, North Carolina. We chose Rivers because of the large number of offenders housed there at the time, and it was approximately 225 miles away from the district. At the time, it was 1,100 offenders there. Now they have approximately 500 to 600 offenders in that facility. Our work at Rivers began with the implementation of a video mentoring as part of our faith-based community partnership. The program linked inmates nearing release with faith-based mentors who provided pre-release encouragement and post-release support. This program was an extension of an existing effort started the previous year where volunteer mentors from local faith institutions were matched with reentrants transitioning through the halfway house. We believe that by making matches earlier, we could better prepare the mentees for reentry and lay the foundation for post-release. CISOSA installed video conferencing systems at Rivers and at our headquarters to allow mentors and mentees to have face-to-face -face conversations about job development, locating stable housing, and establishing new and more positive leisure time activities and friendships. Family members were also present during some of these sessions. In October, we began conducting community resource days for a group of 200 plus offenders at Rivers. During this program, we piloted it by transporting several of our vendors to Winter, North Carolina. After that, we began conducting these sessions by video conferencing. That way, we were able to expand some of the uh, vendors that were participating in our resource day. They included presentations by the U.S. Parole Commission, BOP and Hope Village, our community supervision officers, local job training providers, the D.C. State Superintendent of Education and the Community College of the District of Columbia, the Housing Counseling Service and Jubilee Housing, Unity Healthcare, and the D.C. HIV AIDS Administration, among others. Surveys by both our providers and offenders were very positive and they were completely satisfied with that program. Now, we suspended the mentoring program in 2007 after expanding the community-based mentoring program to include men and women on probation. This increased the demand for mentors and quickly exhausted our availability of pool. However, we plan to reinstitute this video conferencing by including the women in Hazleton, West Virginia, who are also now participating in a pilot program conducted by our place. Last fall, with the cooperation of the BOP, we developed and distributed community resource day packages to all of the offenders in all of the institutions and BOP facilities. We have been asked to send additional packets, which the inmates found very useful. The response has been overwhelming, positive, and we continue to receive requests. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Poteet. Ms. Levine, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the implications of D.C. felons being housed far from their homes. I am director of the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where we've conducted extensive research on the topic of prisoner reentry. We've documented the many challenges of prisoner reentry, and we've conducted studies to identify the <coughs> factors that predict both successful prisoner reintegration as well as recidivism. Among these studies, we've specifically examined DC code felons. We've learned that, like their counterparts throughout the country, incarcerated DC code felons return home in need of health care, drug treatment, jobs, and affordable shelter. But DC felons face an unusual incarceration experience in that they are typically incarcerated hundreds of miles from their families, their potential employers, and post-release services. 
In fact, over 20 percent of these felons are housed more than 500 miles from their homes. This compares to a national average for the average state prisoner of about 100 miles from their home. Still pretty far, but their experience is much more severe in this regard. So why is distance an important issue? Research points to two reasons. First, it can diminish family support. And second, it makes finding treatment and services <coughs> difficult. Let's focus on the family issue first. Our studies have found that families are an important influence on the reentry process, and they provide much needed support to returning prisoners. Both emotional support and tangible support, such as housing and financial assistance, are associated with higher employment rates and reduced substance use after their release. This support from families, however, is not a given. Rather, it is closely linked to the nature and type of contact that prisoners have with their family members, their parents, their intimate partners, and their children prior to their release. In fact, our research has found that in-prison contact with family members is predictive of the strength of family relationships following release. Other studies have shown that family contact during incarceration is associated with lower recidivism rates. Such contact can maintain or reinforce attachments to children, giving exiting prisoners a greater stake in conformity upon release. We have learned that exiting male prisoners who have strong positive attachments to their children tend to be legally employed for longer periods of time than fathers who have weaker ties to their kids. Maintaining and even strengthening family ties during incarceration can bolster the positive impact that family can have after a prisoner's release. But our surveys of family members of prisoners found that the single greatest barrier to maintaining contact was that prison was far from their homes. Clearly, the closer prisoners are housed to their homes, the more contact they will have with family. Now let's turn to the second reason that distance creates problems for returning prisoners. In addition to family support, ties to post-release jobs and reentry services are vital for reentry success. Research finds that the most effective reentry programs begin behind bars and continue in the community. Now we work with a lot of state uh, prison administrators and we hear them lamenting about how difficult it is for them to link up uh, people who are housed in prisons often far from their homes um, to services because they tend to live in cities um, rather than in, in the remote areas where prisons are located. But at least those administrators are working within the same state system. Mm -hmm. By contrast, the reentry planners working with DC felons are operating in, in with different systems and in a diverse set of states across the country. The distance between a correctional facility and the prisoner's post-release destination makes connecting with employment, housing, substance abuse treatment, faith-based institutions, and a whole host of other reentry resources all the more difficult. Now, to be fair, there are some likely downsides to housing prisoners close to home. From a correctional security standpoint, if, the, if a felons are closer to home, visitation will go up. And with increased visitation, there could be more possibilities for the introduction of contraband into the facility. And if DC code felons are housed in fewer prisons closer to home, correctional officers would need to monitor the potential for gang violence more closely. These are real risks, but I, I believe they're far outweighed by the documented benefits of housing prisoners close to home. With all the challenges associated with the reentry of DC felons, this is one change that could have a real positive impact, not only on the successful transition of those returning home from prison, but also on the safety and well-being of the families and communities to which they return. In the meantime, efforts to facilitate connections between prisoners <coughs> and post-release service providers through the use of video conferencing should be supported and expanded, and they should also include contact with family members. Thank you for your time. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Levine. Mr. Farnese, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony, and thank you also to Congresswoman Norton. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Congresswoman Norton, for your work on these issues. My name is Philip Farnese. I serve as director of the D.C. Prisoners Project. 
the Washington Lawyers Committee. We advocate on behalf of D.C. prisoners held locally and in Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities um, around issues around safety, health care, access to the courts. We also represent folks in parole hearings. So we have a lot of experience directly in these facilities where D.C. prisoners are held. As described in my written testimony, so I'll just summarize a bit. The Revitalization Act, of course, transformed the district's criminal justice system from an almost exclusively local system to a federalized system. Our entire justice, criminal justice system, from prosecution uh, through sentencing, through uh, incarceration, and then back to parole supervision and revocation, is all federal. Our <clears throat> this was, uh, the criminal justice system was cr made this way um, by a federal legislature in which D.C. citizens, of course, have no vote. So we have very little control um, over this situation. Nonetheless, this is a useful conversation to have. Um, to address, these are issues that our organization has tried to address at all levels, with the Vice President's Office, with the Bureau of Prisons, with Congresswoman Norton as well. As we've mentioned, about 6,100 D.C. prisoners are held in at least 98 different federal prisons, spread out from California to Florida to Pennsylvania and beyond. As described earlier, the Memorandum of Understanding with the Bureau of Prisons strives to keep D.C. prisoners within 500 miles of home. This actually is consistent with pre-existing BOP policy. The federal government has provided no further accommodation or legal commitment for the influx of D.C. prisoners happening eight or nine years ago. It's only about three or four percent of the population. For 6,000 D.C. prisoners, the 500-mile radius is a geographic area that reaches from Indiana and Kentucky on the west, Georgia in the south, and upper New York State on the north. This is a rather huge distance. So although D.C. prisoners represent only 3 percent or so of the total BOP population, the BOP is effectively D.C.'s state prison, as Congresswoman has mentioned earlier. The entire population of D.C.'s returning citizens have endured incarceration in these far-flung facilities. The district retains no control or influence over which facilities will house the prisoners, what programs will be available to them, the security levels within the BOP, or how far away they are from D.C. they will be held. As you've heard, this, this situation causes serious problems. Family separation is the most obvious one, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away. These prisons are located in rural areas, requiring a car generally to get to. Because D.C. prisoners are dispersed so widely, difficult for local organizations to set up any kind of bus system or any way for people to can large numbers to visit at any one time. Um, this is one a major obstacle. Telephone calls are extremely expensive. Collect calls run about $15 for a 15-minute collect call. Um, there is debit calling also available. It reduces that cost to about $3.50 to $4 for a 15-minute call. However, please note that even a well-paid prisoner who works perhaps in the Unicor program will make maybe $70 a month. So this is an extremely uh, expensive outlay for a prisoner to make. In addition to this, um, as Ms. Levine has, has detailed, I think, quite uh, accurately, having D.C. prisoners dispersed makes reentry extremely complex, not only because it's impossible to interview for a job or set up a housing from long distance, but also because the case management staff and counselors in these facilities have no experience of D.C. I'm reminded when I visited the one facility holding D.C. juveniles in the Bureau of Prisons in North Dakota, as, the chair, as Congresswoman Norton noted, um, and the teacher in that facility asked me, I asked him, what would be a very useful thing for us to give you to help these kids? He said, could you send us a yellow pages from the District of Columbia? Well, that clearly did not indicate that he had any real clue as to how someone from that facility was going to get a job back in D.C. or had any idea what life is like for an urban kid now in North Dakota and then re returning. So I want to make a couple recommendations and cut this a little shorter. Um, I've left in my written statement, it goes a little bit more detail, but I would echo uh, Congresswoman Norton's statement to move um, all D.C. prisoners within, if not one, at least a small number of federal facilities close to D.C. This would have enormous impact on reentry. It would have an impact on family ties being maintained. To, there are facilities in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania within 250 miles of D.C. Some combination of these could certainly be work. There are medical facilities within a fairly short distance um, in North Carolina.